In this video, we're going to discuss the IUPAC convention for naming acyclic alkanes. So the goal here is to generate a name from a chemical structure that uniquely identifies the compound in question. Keep in mind as we go through the rules and conventions and each step of the process, what the purpose of each step is. This will help you remember the steps and the purpose of each when it comes time to apply the process to a new molecule. The process for naming alkanes proceeds in three general steps. The first step is to find and identify what's called the parent chain, and from the length of the parent chain to identify the base name. That's the first specific step within this general process. The second specific step is to number this chain, and that has to do with the groups that are coming off of the chain, as we'll see shortly. Once we've found and numbered the parent chain, we need to identify what are called the substituents and their positions along the chain. So in the background to this slide, you can see that I've drawn a tree. And a good way to think about alkanes is as a tree. The trunk of the tree is what we call the parent chain. And the branches coming off of the trunk are what we call the substituents. So here, the parent chain is the long, thick trunk, and the substituents are the branches coming off of the trunk. The name needs to identify both what the substituents are and their positions along the parent chain. So a substituent that is further up the tree, so to speak, is obviously non-equivalent to a substituent that's lower down on the tree, even if they have the same molecular structure. So after we've identified the substituents along with their positions using those numbers that we found in step one, the idea is to list the substituents and their positions as prefixes on the base name. So the base name, the name of the trunk, shows up at the end of the name, and the substituents show up at the beginning. Now let's look at a couple of specific examples to see how to apply the general process to a specific problem. So we have two alkanes here, and the first step in generating the names of these alkanes according to the IUPAC process is to find what's called the parent chain. Now what is exactly the parent chain? Well, there are three words here that I want you to keep in mind. It's the longest continuous chain. It's the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. Continuous meaning that the carbons are bound to one another. Longest meaning it contains more carbons than any other possible continuous chain within the structure. And it's a chain, meaning all the carbons have to be connected to one another. The parent chain is the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in the structure. And this can be a little bit tricky when you're first starting out. For example, in the left-hand structure, the temptation is to, say, start with the methyl group. You'll always want to start with the methyl group, by the way, when you're looking for the parent chain. This is one reason I like to draw the methyl groups out. You'll often see them omitted with just the line ending with nothing, but this tips you off that, hey, I need to start here when looking for the parent chain. And then walk along the chain, and we count the number of carbons. And the temptation, right, is just to continue going across from left to right. This is a really nice looking chain. It's clean. It zigzags beautifully. However, it's not the parent chain because it's not the longest continuous chain. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons within the chain that I've highlighted in green. However, imagine instead of going to this last methyl group when we had a choice at this carbon, we actually went upward. In that case, and I'll highlight that in blue, we see that we end up with a slightly longer chain. So now, going up through this group up here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons in the chain. So the blue chain is the parent here. That's the longest continuous chain. And just a brief word about why we look for the longest continuous chain and call that the parent. The idea is simplification. By identifying the longest chain and thinking about the substituents as branches coming off of that, we simplify the name of the structure as much as possible. So we pack as many carbons as we possibly can into the name of a straight chain alkane with no branches, methane, ethane, propane, etc. This compound on the right is even trickier. So we can start at any of these methyl groups when we're looking for the parent chain. I tend to visually look either all the way to the left or all the way to the right. So we could, for example, start here and move around this way, and we're going to keep going as long as you can, keep going to a carbon that bears another carbon until you absolutely can't do that anymore. So that process leads us to identify the chain I've highlighted in blue as the parent chain in this compound. 
the next sort of sub-step of the first stage is to number the parent chain. And here things get a little bit tricky too. A chain by definition has two ends. And so when we go to assign numbers to the parent chain, there are almost always two non-equivalent ways to number. So let me show you the idea in this compound on the left. So we could, for example, start here and number this carbon one and move across to the right, numbering like so. Or alternatively, and I'll draw this in black, we could start on the right and move to the left. And this is a non-equivalent numbering scheme that I'm drawing in black. The way you can see that is to examine carbon three slash six. This carbon has a methyl group and under the black numbering scheme, we would call it a 3-methyl group, but under the red numbering scheme, we would call it a 6-methyl group. So these numbering schemes are non-equivalent. What we need here is a convention that establishes the quote-unquote right way to do things. So it's arbitrary, but this is one of those moments when IUPAC comes to the rescue. And according to the IUPAC rules, the correct way to number gives the smallest numbers to the substituents as possible. So that is worth keeping in mind. So three more words to keep in mind when you're naming alkanes. Smallest numbers possible. When you come across two distinct ways to number the parent chain, and this happens extremely, extremely often, use the way that gives the smallest numbers possible to all substituents. In this particular example, the right end of the chain, this methyl group here, is closer to this substituent. And so that's where we'll start numbering. You'll see that this will give the smaller number to the methyl substituent. So this is the numbering scheme from right to left that I just drew. And notice that the number for the methyl group under this scheme is three and not six. Remember, that's the number we got using the old scheme. So this numbering scheme is the correct one to use according to IUPAC's arbitrary but essential rule to give the smallest numbers possible to the substituents when numbering. We have an even more complicated situation on the right-hand side where we see multiple substituents. So how do we decide here? Well, the idea is still smallest numbers possible. And we use the same general idea of starting the numbering at the end of the chain that's closest to a substituent. So here, actually the left-hand end of the chain is closer to a methyl substituent. Notice that we have to walk three carbons over to find a methyl substituent from the right-hand side, but we need walk only one carbon over to find a methyl substituent from the left-hand end of the chain. So we start numbering on the left-hand end and move across to the right. And I won't prove this here, but if you look at the other numbering scheme, you'll notice that the total sum of the numbers, or if we compare the numbers pairwise, the black numbering scheme gives the smallest numbers possible to all the substituents and not just that first methyl group. Step two, once we've dealt with the parent chain, is to identify the substituents. And here, for alkyl substituents, it's worth keeping in mind that alkyl substituents are named using the suffix il. So we take, in fact, the ane that shows up in the name of the parent alkane, and we replace it with il to generate the substituent. So to give you an example of this, the CH3 substituent is essentially a derivative of CH4, where we've replaced one of the H's with something else, a different alkyl chain, and this is called the methyl group. In the compounds you see above, we have all methyl substituents. So in this guy on the left, for example, we have a methyl substituent right here, and I would encourage you to make a list, particularly when you're starting out, of the substituents you find with their numbers. So this I'm gonna call 3-methyl, over here on the right, we actually see multiple methyl groups. So we have one at the two position, one at the three position, and one at the five position. So I'm just gonna go ahead and list them all at this stage. We have a two methyl, we have a three methyl, and we have a five methyl. And the name, again, needs to account for all of these substituents. So in the left-hand case, it's not so bad. We can simply just toss three methyl into the name and call it a day. But on the right-hand compound, we have three different methyl groups, and it would get out of control in terms of number of characters if we had to list 2-methyl, 3-methyl, and 5-methyl all within the name. Here is the motivation for the IUPAC convention of using the di, tri, and tetra prefixes to indicate multiple copies of the same substituent. And this just saves us on characters. But the prefix that we generate using ditri and tetra needs to include all of this information. 
So the way we do this is we take the positional numbers and we list them from smallest to largest, and then we use either die, tri, or tetra to indicate the number of copies of the functional group present, either two, three, or four. Here we have three, so this is a tri, and then we just list the name of the alkyl substituent, methyl. This one relatively succinct prefix encodes all the essential information about all three methyl groups. The final step, after we've found and numbered the parent chain and identified the substituents and their names, is to actually construct the name. And this is done by taking the list of substituents and arranging them alphabetically before what's called the base name, which comes from the length of the parent chain. So in the example on the left, we have an 8-carbon chain. That makes the base name octane. And the substituents, well, we only have one in this case on the left, we have a 3-methyl. So we just pop that 3-methyl down before the base name, and the full name of this compound is 3-methyl octane. No space there. Just list this all as one word. The right-hand structure, we have the 235 trimethyl substituents. Like the left-hand example, the parent chain is eight carbons long, so this is 235 trimethyl octane. The one point that's worth keeping in mind that doesn't apply to these examples but will apply in future cases is to alphabetize the substituents based on the first letter of the name of the substituent without di, tri, and tetra if it's relevant. So here we would alphabetize using M as the letter for the substituent and not the T in this case on the right. All right, so there was a lot within those examples, but I want to revisit the overview so that we can see some of the finer quirks associated with each step. Step one is to find a number of the parent chain and identify the base name. Be sure to hunt pretty rigorously for the longest continuous chain of carbons. It can be easy to miss, but the more you practice with this, the easier it'll get to see parent chains within an alkane structure. Step two is to identify the substituents and their positions. So when you number, give substituents the smallest numbers possible, and if you find multiple copies of a substituent, use di, tri, and tetra, and be sure to include the corresponding number of locations before that prefix. So if you use a di prefix, you need two numbers before it. Tri prefix, you need three numbers before it. Tetra, you need four numbers before it. This is true even if the substituents show up on the same position in the main chain. So for example, if you have a di methyl situation where both methyls show up at the two position, list two, two dimethyl there. The final step, list the substituents with their positions as prefixes to the base name. And if you made a list of substituents in step two, this is relatively easy. Be sure to alphabetize by the name of the alkyl group. So ignore the di, tri, and tetra when you're going to alphabetize.